Hello friends, welcome to Political Science and International Relations. In this lecture, we are going to study the perspectives on Indian national movement. This is a subtopic under the larger topic, Indian nationalism in section B of paper 1. Under Indian nationalism, we will now study the perspectives on Indian national movement. This is an important topic under the syllabus. UPSC often focus on the perspectives. Indian National Movement You should be well aware of the Indian National Movement which ultimately paved way for the independence of our country. The Indian National Movement is viewed by different schools of thought differently. It is viewed by different scholars differently. Marxists view it differently. Orientalists view it differently. Feminists view it differently. Dalit scholars view differently. So, there are different viewpoints regarding the Indian national movement. So, we are going to study these different perspectives. Before studying the perspectives, we will briefly look into the concept of nation. The term nation is often used along with the term state. These two terms are interchangeably used. But there is a difference between these two terms. State is more of a political concept. State is a territorial unit. It is a political concept. The state has certain characteristics. The state has a territory. The state exercises sovereignty, it exercises legitimate power which is called authority. The state has its own government, the government is an apparatus, it is a substantial institution that governs the state. The state has its own population called the citizenry. On the other hand, nation is more of a psychological concept, it is a mental construct we can say. Nation is a feeling of oneness among a community of people who share a common identity. So, a common identity unites people. Sometimes there can be a nation even without a state. Take the example of the Kurdish people. The Kurdish people don't have a home state, but they are a nation. They have a consciousness that they are one. What is uniting them? The Kurdish culture is uniting them. The language is uniting them. So nation is more of a psychological concept. People feel that they have a brotherly relationship with each other. The Sri Lankan Tamils, they are an example of a nation without a state. They have been fighting in the past for a home state in the state of Sri Lanka but now this issue is largely settled. So understand the concept of nation. If you look at the western world the concept of nation later led to state formation. This started happening around the 16th century. The Treaty of Westphalia is an important turning point. Treaty of Westphalia Treaty of Westphalia 1648 led to the emergence of nation states in Europe. On the other hand, if you look at the third world, developing countries of today, the concept of state 
is actually strengthening the concept of nation. Even India is called a nation of nations by some scholars. Take the African countries. Many of the African countries are multi-ethnic. In some of these countries, different ethnicities fight with each other. Take Rwanda for example. There was a great conflict between two communities, tribal communities, Hutus and the Tutsis. Now Rwanda was already established as a state. It was freed from British imperialism many decades back. Now it is an independent state. But even after obtaining independence, the psychological feeling that the people of Rwanda are one was not present. The community saw them as different political groups. As a result, they fought with each other for power. In the year 1994, a great genocide happened in Rwanda in which more than 5 lakh people were killed. So this is an example of states where the concept of nation is not strong but the concept of state is already present. This phenomenon you will mainly find in the developing world. Most of the countries which obtain independence after the second world war. The concept of nation itself is contested. Different scholars have different view of nationalism. The American political scientist Walker Connor, he is remarking about nationalism. Walker Connor, American political scientist, he tells that the concept of nation is an elusive concept, difficult to find out, difficult to define. He is also telling that the concept of nation is difficult to define and conceptualize. So defining and conceptualizing itself becomes a challenge. This is a view of Walker Connor. Take the state of Rwanda for example, the Hutus saw them as a separate nation, the Tutsis saw them as a separate nation. Even today there are people in Northern Ireland in UK who are demanding separation from UK. The reason is the concept of nation is difficult to define and conceptualize. It is intangible, psychological and elusive in nature. So understand the nature of, of nation. Nation itself is essentially contested concept. According to Marxist, nationalism is a bourgeois concept. Walker Connor tells that it is intangible, elusive and psychological. According to Marxist, nationalism is a bourgeois concept. Who is a bourgeois? Bourgeois is a ruling class. It is a dominant class in any society according to Marx. The bourgeois class has ownership of property. It controls the state. The workers are dominated by the bourgeois class. According to Marxists, nationalism itself is a product of false consciousness. Marxists will tell that the bourgeois class talks about nationalism. But when they talk about nationalism, they are actually not talking about the equality and the welfare of all the people in the country, but they are actually talking about bourgeois welfare. Got it? So Marxist view of nationalism is very important. We will now look into the debates on Indian nationalism under which we will study different perspective. There is a lack of consensus among the scholars, historians and thinkers about the political activities which happened during the British period from 1857 to 1947. There is a big debate about the Indian National Movement, INM in short, from 1857 till independence, 1947, many political activities took place in India. Now there is a big 
disagreement among scholars regarding these activities that spanned nearly a century. Now many scholars, they say that all these activities can be described as part of the national movement. The Sipai Mutiny of 1857, the Swadeshi movement, formation of Indian National Congress, and the opposition against the partition of Bengal, non-cooperation movement, civil disobedience movement, Quit India movement, all these activities are seen as part of the INM, Indian National Movement. So this is called the Grand Theory or the Meta Theory. According to the Grand Theory or the Meta Theory, all these activities spanning nearly 100 years come under the Indian National Movement. Now this meta narrative or the grand theory is challenged by many schools of thought. This is where the perspectives come into play. Marxists, Dalits, feminists, subaltern philosophers, they are challenging the meta narrative. They are telling that these events cannot be clubbed together as having same characteristics. We should differentiate, distinguish between the different activities which happened from 1857 to 1947. So this theory is challenged by Marxist, Dalit, philosophers, feminist, radical, humanist. These are the important schools of thought. Now the grand theory. This is also referred to as a nationalist perspective. We will look into the nationalist perspective next. Nationalist perspective generally held by liberals and conservatives. They also tend to be the orientalist. This school of thought is also called the cultural nationalist perspective. Leaders like Nehru belong to the liberal school. Scholars like uh, Rabindranath Tagore, Lala Lajpat Rai, Aurobindo Ghosh belong to the cultural nationalist school of thought. Before studying the nationalist perspective or the nationalist school of thought, we will first look into the colonial perspective. Studying the colonial perspective is important for understanding the nationalist perspective. So we will start with the colonial perspective. Because the nationalist perspective itself is challenging the colonial perspective. It is a counter reaction to the colonial perspective. The British after conquering India they tried to rule India not just through force, but they tried to rule India also through hegemony. Now, what is this hegemony? Hegemony is used to convince the people of a country that colonialism is good. British did by bringing in rule of law. They brought representative institutions. They were prepared to bring in socio-religious reforms. They brought in many reforms which helped bring in equality even though the British overall subjugated India. So this hegemony was used to prove that the British rule was better and that the British rule was beneficial to the Indian people. And the British they challenged the idea of India as a nation. So they told that India was not a nation in the first place. And that the British rule was beneficial for the Indian people. So Indians can be civilized by the British. This was the viewpoint. Administrators like Dufferin, Curzon, Risley, 
they held this view. The colonial perspective is also referred to as a Cambridge school. It is based on Eurocentrism. Eurocentrism is a philosophy which upholds the European society and its values as superior compared to other societies. This is called Eurocentrism. So the colonial perspective scholars were sticking to Eurocentrism and they were criticizing the concept of India itself. Look into the view of Dufferin, the, Duff, the man Dufferin called Congress as a microscopic minority. These scholars held the view that there was no India and it never was. Indian National Movement, according to the Cambridge School, was just a set of political activities. It was not a movement. It was just a set of political activities by Western interest. These political activities were carried on in a selfish manner and these activities were not carried forward to ensure welfare of India as a state. So the Cambridge School scholars were strongly criticizing the nationalist leaders of India at the time. According to the school, the communal leaders, local leaders and poor brokers were actually competing among themselves in a selfish manner and they were not actually fighting against the British. In fact, this view was true to a certain extent, but it was not completely true. Many zamindars, landlords, princes and the reactionary elements, they were actually fighting for their own interest and they were not actually fighting the British. The zamindars, many of them supported the British at that time because the British policies were beneficial to the zamindars. Now, the nationalist perspective. Nationalist perspective criticizes the colonial perspective. We already said that the colonial perspective was based on Eurocentrism. The nationalist perspective is challenging Eurocentrism. The fundamental claim of the nationalist perspective is that Indians as a whole had contradictions with imperialism and the British Empire. So they are attacking the colonial perspective. Colonial perspective tells that British rule is beneficial for Indians, but nationalist perspective is attacking this narrative. It tells that Indians as a whole were opposed to imperialism. Indians as a whole were opposed to the British Empire. The British Empire in the name of bringing welfare and development to India was actually exploiting India. It was doing injustice to the Indian people. It was trying to divide the Indian people through its policy of divide and rule. It was appeasing different sections of society and it was trying to weaken Indian nationalism. Therefore, the Indians were actually opposing imperialism as well as the British Empire. So the nationalist perspective was very clear in that the British rule was detrimental to India and it was actually subjugating the great nation and civilization that was India. This nationalist perspective can be divided into two schools. One school is a liberal school and the other is a cultural nationalist school. Liberal and cultural nationalist. In today's India, you can roughly place Congress here and the BJP here. 
liberal nationalist perspective this school it agreed that india was not a ancient nation but india definitely became a nation in the modern period especially after the 19th century the important scholars under liberal perspective are surendranath banerji m g ranade and dada bhai navroji they held the view that the british rule was definitely detrimental to india and indians definitely had basic contradictions with the british empire and imperialism why contradictions with imperialism imperialism insults the greatness of a country imperialism exploits another country so definitely imperialism was opposed by indians at the same time the british empire was the imperial power naturally indians were opposing the british empire also the nationalist perspective was idea centric it was based on a idea but some of the scholars in the liberal perspective they appreciated the british rule in certain areas because the british brought reforms to india they brought in western education they brought western modern thoughts to india as far as these areas are concerned the liberals they somewhat admired the british rule but the liberals definitely argued for freedom for india yesen banerjee's book a nation in the making Dada Bhai Navroji's book, Drain of Wealth. He clearly analyzed the economic exploitation of India by the British Empire. But the liberal scholars were attacked by the other school, cultural nationalist school. Okay, what is this cultural nationalist school? The cultural nationalist school is also called the orientalist school. it is also based on idea it is idea centric this school is based on essentialism essentialism tells that if there is a certain concept or an idea then certain elements can be attributed to it this is called essentialism for example essentialist may hold the view that attributes like power violence and dominations are attributed to male and care love and protection of environment are attributed to women similarly a nation is also connected with certain values a nation has many cultural values a nation may be associated with a particular language or a religion or it may be synchronous with a particular civilization so this is called essentials these scholars they opposed the eurocentrism of the colonial perspective we already studied that the colonial perspective was based on eurocentrism eurocentrism sees europe as superior and india as inferior and as a result they want the european values to be brought to india but the cultural nationalist they hold the view that india is unique india has its own values and it is not inferior to the west or europe the important scholars coming under the cultural national perspective are aurobindo ghosh Rabindranath Tagore, 
सावरकर एंड हिस्टोरियंस लाइक के पी जयशवाल एंड सो वन लाला लजपत राय is also an important scholar under the cultural nationalist perspective these scholars have tried to prove that india was a ancient civilization liberal school accepted that india was not a ancient nation but a nation only in the modern period but cultural nationalist perspective tells that india was a ancient nation for example lara rajput roy told that india was a nation for 2000 years He told that India was a nation for two thousand years. He was trying to prove to the British people that Indian culture and India as a nation was not inferior to British culture in any manner. And Indians definitely had a cause to fight for independence because they are already a nation. The historian K. P. Jaiswal he tells that. india had ancient civilization india is not inferior to great britain whatever the british empire can boast of definitely india possesses those aspects for example he tells that india had ancient civilization india had empires india had uh, constitutional monarchies and india had the republican system in the past so whatever the british could claim india could also claim so india was definitely equal as great britain if not superior to great britain and as such india definitely needs its independence from the british empire rabindra tagore he also belongs to the culture nationalist school but he was more of a cosmopolitan he tells that the indian civilization was an inclusive civilization even foreigners who came from outside the indian subcontinent were later brought within the indian culture they settled within the indian culture greeks huns shakas and so on so indian civilization was a great civilization which was a commingling of many other cultures so you should to remember the important scholars and the views many historians also belong to the nationalist perspective their writings reflect the concept of india as a nation rc mazumdar tarachand they come under the nationalist perspective if you look at uh, nehru's view nehru's view belongs to the liberal perspective but nehru's view also belong to the socialist perspective we will study socialist perspective next it is interesting to note that nehru falls in two categories he was definitely a liberal he supports democracy he supports equality he supports economic and social justice at the same time so he can be seen as a liberal he can also be seen as a socialist but unlike ambedkar nehru was not a constitutionalist this is very important in fact nehru opposed congress forming ministries in their 1937 he wanted congress to go for practical action so he was against congress forming ministries after winning the elections at the same time nehru was a socialist according to nehru socialism can be achieved in india he was very optimistic of achieving socialism but the socialism has to be achieved through democracy 
he saw the Indian National Congress as a platform for achieving socialism. That is why Nehru stayed within the Indian National Congress, supported Gandhi, even though Nehru was a socialist. Congress Socialist Party was formed as a wing within Indian National Congress. But Nehru did not join the CSP. He stayed within the nationalist leadership. At the same time, he remained a socialist. Many leaders of CSP supported Nehru because they saw Nehru as a socialist. They saw Nehru as someone who can tilt Congress to the left. So we have studied the colonial perspective and the nationalist perspective. Nationalist perspective in turn consisted of two perspectives, which are the liberal perspective and the cultural nationalist perspective. Next perspective is a Marxist perspective. This is a very important perspective. Marxist. The important scholars under Marxist perspective are S. A. Dange, Eamon Roy, Professor Irfan Habib, among others, A. R. Desai also comes under the Marxist school of thought. Now, the Marxist, they are belonging to the nationalist perspective. At the same time, they also stick to the mother philosophy, which is Marxism. So on one hand, Marxism is a humanist and global perspective. At the same time, in the Indian context, it is also seen as a nationalist perspective because the Marxist scholars are opposing British imperialism. They wanted British to go out of India. They saw the British as economically exploiting the Indian people. The analysis of the Marxists revolves around economic exploitation and domination. As such, they clearly opposed the British rule. They saw British as the bourgeois class or the ruling class who were economically exploiting and dominating India. But the Marxist perspective, it was opposing other perspective. The Marxist perspective was opposing the colonial nationalist perspective also. Because the colonial nationalist perspective was trying to revisit the past and recreate the past. It was seeking the roots of Indian nationalism in the past. But the past contained so many injustices. That is why the Marxist perspective was unable to accept, accept the cultural nationalist perspective. Because the culture it uh, historically contained exploitation, injustice and discrimination. The Varna system and the caste system inherently had discrimination and exploitation. So they did not feel that it was correct to look into the roots of Indian nationalism in the past. So the Marxist perspective was attacking the British rule which was exploiting India from outside. At the same time, the Marxist perspective was also attacking the internal exploitation, upper caste, zamindars, and the ruling class. They were exploiting the Indian people. So the Marxist perspective looked at both the British rulers as well as the domestic rulers as exploiters of the working class in India. So this is the uniqueness of the Marxist perspective. Marxist perspective opposes the colonial perspective, but it is also opposing the cultural nationalist perspective. The, the colonial perspective was uh, criticized by the Marxists for holding a discriminatory view of the Indian people. The Cambridge school saw the Indian people as inferior. They upheld the British values as superior. This was rejected by the Marxist at the same time. They also oppose the cultural nationalist view. But some Marxist scholars oppose the concept of nationalism itself. They saw nationalism as false consciousness. They saw nationalism as a bourgeois construct.
that is why at the start of the second world war many marxists in india suddenly changed their view earlier they were working within the larger indian national movement they were fighting along with leaders such as gandhi but when the second world war was about to happen they took a separate path so they started the people's war so far they were looking at the indian national movement as a struggle against british domination the british who are seen as exploiters of the indian people but when the british people entered the second world war fighting the fascist now the marxist wanted to support the british now they saw the second world war as anti fascist war from now on the marxist wanted the indian nationalist leadership to support the british at least temporarily so so that fascism is first defeated for this reason many marxists did not participate under the quit india movement this is a major criticism against the communist leadership and the marxist leadership even today but nevertheless many marxists took part in the quit india movement going against the guidelines given by the overall leadership so we have studied the marxist perspective next is the socialist perspective what is the difference between marxism and socialism many have a confusion differentiating marxism socialism and communism under the marxism ideology communism is seen as the last stage of human history capitalism contains its seeds of destruction so capitalism will eventually disintegrate and the world will move towards communism when communism is achieved there will be no state instead of different nation states the people in the world will live together as equals so this is envisaged by communism no state no money no private property so there will be an international society of free people but when capitalism tries to ultimately transform into communism an intermittent stage an intermediate stage is envisaged by marxism this is called socialism in the intermediate stage socialism there will be a state here state is seen as necessary now why is the state necessary the state is necessary so that the workers can further complete the revolution and achieve communism in socialism the workers will be given leadership by a vanguard party in the context of ussr the vanguard party was a bolshevik party which later became the communist party of ussr so this is the difference between socialism and communism so socialism is seen as a concept under the larger philosophy of marxism communism is the end stage but socialism itself is seen as a separate ideology and philosophy by other scholars they look at socialism as a separate philosophy outside marxism according to socialism the state should be in the ownership of production the state should own all the key industries under socialism there should be equality among all people there should not be any distribution people's welfare should be ensured there is no private property and there are no different classes in society no different 
classes, no private property, welfare for all, equality for all. Socialism can accept the concept of state. And there are many brands under socialism. Now, all socialists are not Marxist. Okay? So understand the key difference. In the Indian National Movement, there were many socialists. They formed the CSP, Congress Socialist Party, in the year 1934. Apart from this, socialists need not always argue for revolution. But Marxists argue for revolution. Capitalism will become communism through revolution only. Class conflict will happen. Revolution will happen. The workers will take over the control of the state. And ultimately, communist society will be achieved. When it comes to socialists, many socialists don't argue for revolution. They are happy to accept democracy and achieve socialism through democracy itself. Nehru himself belongs to this category. He was a socialist, but he wanted socialism to be achieved through democracy. He was against violence. Nehru did not support revolution. Okay, CSP. Congress Socialist Party was established in 1934. This was a landmark event because the CSP tilted Congress towards the left. The CSP leaders worked under Congress leadership. Initially, many of them opposed Gandhi, but later they accepted Gandhi's leadership. The important leaders in CSP are J.P. Narayan, Ramano Lohia, RML, Ramana Harlovia, Acharya Narendra Dev, and Muthuramalingam from South India. Now, the CSP it took a middle stance between Congress on one hand and Marxist on the other hand. According to the Indian Socialist, INC led by Gandhi was not representing the real interest of the working class. The Socialist saw Gandhi as a leader who is following mysticism, a leader who is not giving importance to economic equality. A leader who is not giving importance to science. This is the view of Congress Socialists regarding Gandhi. So they were critical of Gandhi. At the same time, they were also critical of the Marxists. The Marxists were seen by the Socialists as having a sectarian approach. Sectarian approach. They were not prepared to work under the larger ambit of the Indian National Movement. They were looking towards the Soviet Union for guidance. So they were theoretically sticking to Marxism, they are not practical and they were sectarian in nature. So CSP stuck a middle path. They stayed under the leadership of Gandhi even though they initially opposed Gandhi but they wanted to pull the Indian national movement towards the left. Yemen Roy, socialist as well as Marxist, he was instrumental in giving a leftist tilt toward the Indian National Movement. The scholar Granville Austin has remarked about Eamon Roy. It was Eamon Roy who actually tilted the Indian National Movement towards the left. Initially, Eamon Roy was an orthodox Marxist. Later, he himself criticized Marxism. He became a radical humanist. The important socialist leaders or J.P. Narayan, Ramana, Lohia and others. J.P. Narayan was initially critical of Gandhi. He criticized Gandhi because Gandhi was not giving importance to social change and economic change. J.P. Narayan followed Lenin's approach. According to Lenin, wherever people in a country are fighting against imperialism, 
द कम्युनिस्ट पार्टी इन दट कंट्री हेज टू जॉइन हैंड्स विद द नेशनलिस्ट पार्टी If you apply this in India, the Communist in India, the Communist Party (CPI) should work with Indian National Congress. In case of China, the Nationalist Party was a human tank party. In fact, the human tank party worked with the Communist earlier. Later, they fought with each other. So this was the first stage prescribed by Lenin. Now. the communist and nationalist should defeat the imperial power once imperialists are defeated and once independence is achieved then the international organization common turn communist international will help these countries move towards communism so this is a prescription given by lenin j p narayan was following lenin's theory like m n roy j p narayan was also instrumental in giving a leftward tilt to the indian national movement later he started accepting gandhi's leadership he accepted the concept of sarvodaya sarvodaya means development for all and welfare for all sarvodaya later accepted by j p he later started the sampurna kranti in bihar total revolution one of the important aims of sampurna kranti was to attack corruption later jp narayan extended the sampurna kranti against the leadership of ms indira gandhi when she uh, launched the emergency in the year 1975 jp narayan was a very important political figure in the indian national movement as well as post independent india another important socialist leader was rml raman hoy lohia a lesser known political leader today but he was a great leader rml also opposed gandhi's leadership he also opposed the marxist leaders now lohia was analyzing socialism in the asian context he advocated socialist democracy he put forward seven types of revolution this is called sapta kranti sapta means seven kranti means revolution let's not go in depth into the sapta kranti now to tell in brief the important revolutions within the sapta kranti are establishing equality between men and women opposing political economic and race based inequalities destruction of the caste system and opposing foreign domination and imperialism apart from this lohia also gave a blueprint for political formation for the state he gave the concept of a four pillared state it is based on decentralization village district province nation he envisaged a four tier level of governance so that power is not concentrated at the higher level so this reduces the lust for power this ensures that the real power lies in the hands of the people basically he was arguing for a bottom up approach rather than a top down approach so we have covered the important perspectives we will cover two other perspectives i am giving an overall essence of all the perspectives with in depth explanation wherever needed next perspective is subaltern perspective
Subaltern, what is the meaning? Subaltern refers to the social classes which are backward, low in the socio-economic ladder or those classes who are historically discriminated. Politics focusing on these classes is called subaltern politics. The perspective is called subaltern perspective. In the Indian context, the important scholars are Ranajit Guha and Gyan Pandey. The important subaltern groups in India are peasants, farmers, tribals and people who are marginalized in the society. Subaltern scholars like Ranajit Guha and Gyan Pandey criticize Gandhi. They tell that Gandhi was actually working for the interest of bourgeois. In the name of national unity, he tried to actually co-opt the peasants instead of bringing peasants to the mainstream. Even though Gandhi headed peasants movement, he was not actually giving importance to the peasants, but he was rather trying to reconcile the peasant with the exploiting classes. So this is the view held by the subaltern perspective. According to the subaltern perspective, the Indian national movement should have taken into account the real interest, grievances and problems of the subaltern sections like peasants and tribals. But unfortunately, this did not happen happened. The nationalist leadership was elite in nature and it diluted the interest of the subaltern classes. The view of the subaltern school of thought has similarities with the Marxist school of thought. Even Marxist scholars will tell that Gandhi was a bourgeois leader. Whenever Gandhi spearheaded any protest or movement, he was actually trying to reconcile the exploited with the exploiter. Keda Satyagraha, Champaran Satyagraha and so on. Gandhi was not actually fighting for the working class or the peasants. He was actually trying to work as a manager and he was trying to reconcile the exploiter with the exploiter. So subaltern perspective and Marxist have uh, many similarities. Subaltern perspective and Marxist perspective also point out to the role given to women under the Indian national movement and Gandhi. These scholars will tell that Gandhi brought in women under the Indian national movement, but he did not give a predominant role to the women. Marxists go a step further and they will tell that Gandhi actually used women as laborers within the Indian national movement. They were not the protagonists, but they were simply members of the army, which was spearheaded by Gandhi. So these schools severely criticized the uh, Indian National Congress leadership as well as the leadership of Gandhi. The last perspective is Dalit perspective. Important scholars are Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, Jodiba Pule, E. V. R. Popularly called Piriya. According to the Dalit perspective, the Indian national movement and its allied leadership fail to take into account the caste dis discrimination in India. They severely criticize the Indian national movement's leadership. They tell that the leaders of the INM opposed the British rule, but they focused very less on the internal problems in India. One of the major problems was caste discrimination. So when India itself was suffering from 
internal problems. When the lower classes were suffering at the hands of the upper classes, when the lower caste were suffering at the hands of the upper caste, then equal importance should be given to the question of caste and caste discrimination, but the leaders were not doing so. Dr. Ambedkar held the view that the Indian national movement should essentially contain the ideals of equality, liberty and fraternity. These are actually the ideals of the French Revolution. You can see a reflection of the French Revolution in Dr. Ambedkar. Equality, liberty and fraternity. You can never achieve equality without liberty and fraternity. The caste system in India was against liberty and fraternity. A low caste man cannot sit as an equal with a high upper caste man. There is no fraternity. So you don't find the concept of brotherhood in India. Similarly, the caste system is not providing complete liberty. The lower caste people are not having equal access to resources. They are not having equal rights. They are exploited. They are discriminated. So India was essentially lacking liberty and fraternity. As long as there is no liberty and fraternity, there cannot be real equality. Okay. So Indian national movement should aim for all three aspects. This was the vision of Dr. Ambedkar. That is why Dr. Ambedkar wanted a holistic equality. Dr. Ambedkar wanted social, economic and political equality. Without social and economic equality, we cannot achieve political equality. This was the vision of Ambedkar. First ensure social and economic equality, then go for political equality. Take the caste system. Caste system was not providing social equality, is it not? Different jobs were ascribed to different sections. Naturally, there is no economic equality. The son of a carpenter has to become a carpenter. The son of a civil servant will become a civil servant. So when there is economic, when there is social inequality, it is not leading to economic equality. And as a result, there is no political equality. So Ambedkar was focusing on all the three pillars. Dr. Ambedkar even remarks about Bal Gangadhar Tilak, who gave the slogan, Swaraj is my birthright. Dr. Ambedkar told that if Tilak himself was born as an untouchable, that is belonging to the lower caste, then Tilak would have actually demanded annihilation of caste as his birthright. So he holds a very substantial view of inequality in India. Dr. Ambedkar opposed the British rule. At the same time, he opposed the internal contradictions and inequalities within British India. When it comes to feminist perspective, there was uh, no strong feminist school of thought during the Indian national movement. In fact, feminist perspective was reflected in other perspective, especially subaltern perspective, Marxist perspective and the Dalit perspective. Okay friends, we have studied the important perspectives on the Indian national movement. I hope you got different insights from various dimensions. Thank you.